compared to other life forms. Certainly not very old compared to the Earth. But we did an exercise which, you know, all these exercises we have reactions to. Some people consider it absurd, but it's always interesting to try to go out and ask your fundamental life questions of the tree that you're sitting under and see what happens. We call it doing sun zen with the tree. They, if we acknowledge that the trees have been around for a lot longer than we have, we acknowledge their age, we acknowledge their perspective, like the 200-year-old mansion maple up in the forest. It has seen Indians. It has seen Lewis and Clark float by. You know, many, many lives and death, life and life and death, life and death, over and over and over again in those, just those 200 years. Consider how much life and death the earth has seen, how much is dead in the earth that has died and is cradled by the earth. So when we ask the trees for their perspective, uh, sometimes we get answers. Very interesting. So is this new age? Well, I don't know. If the it really depends on is it is it functional in your life. If the answer is functional in your life, then that's all that matters, right? So whether the tree is answering, or whether like a crystal ball or a tarot card, this is just a way of quieting the mind so that we can tap into wisdom beyond wisdom, so we can tap into the eternal wisdom, into Prajnaparamita. It doesn't really matter. We do know that by focusing and quieting the mind, that's possible. So maybe that's the way it works. It doesn't matter as long as it works. Any way that we can move out of our narrow human mind, get out of the way, helps us to access true wisdom, eternal wisdom, meaning it is has no beginning and no end, but it also applies eternally. So it doesn't matter if you're a Neanderthal, if you're a Japanese man, or if you're um, an American teenager, the wisdom is the same. If it changes our life, and as a result, if it benefits us and others around us, then that's wisdom. Or that's compassion. The wisdom and compassion are intertwined. So when the tree appears to respond to us, that's compassion, that's loving kindness, that it's helping us. Some people mentioned the magic that happens at the monastery. This is something we have begun to take for granted, but then a new form of it appears, and it's always interesting how the person you need for a job that's just come up tends to appear, one form of that magic. Uh, but many others, when we put the rational mind on hold, the skeptical mind on hold, and just allow for possibilities. So this can happen to people, it appears to be magic, uh, when they break from old habit patterns. Ways that the mind's neurosis about keeping us from harm and keeping us from dying. When you really look at thoughts, so much of it is preoccupation with how can I keep this person from harm and how can I keep them from dying? Or how can I keep them from getting in trouble? How can I find some solutions to make them happy? So that's the, the mind's continual concern, which is brilliantly unfolded during a session in the silence of session. So how can we break from these old constrictive habit patterns, this prison bo we've boxed ourselves gradually into? We ter use the term liberation in Buddhism a lot. You hear about liberation. And people often expect, well, that's just going to be someday, I'll be sitting and I'll just, there'll be an ex I'll be like hit by lightning and I'll fall to the ground and I'll wake up liberated. Well, there are some interesting uh, sudden experiences that happen, not, not in that way, but sudden uh, insights and awakenings. But there are, all, there are also many small shifts. So my analogy is it's like an earthquake. An earthquake doesn't just happen. There's lots of little signs that the geologists pay attention to, that the earth is shifting, little subtle tremors, right, that the plates are moving and tension is building up and little slips. And so that's as much a part of liberation, those little changes, those little slips, as a big earthquake in practice. 
So liberation means exactly freedom from those old ways of thinking and acting that were once useful, that once maybe saved our life. And then once we're free of them, we have freedom to explore more of life, other ways of doing things. So I'll ask people to just give us a couple of brief examples. So Andrew, I'm going to ask you about art. So what, you, what was your old... Uh, I used to... Um, yeah, I used to absolutely hate doing art, uh, art class like, at school. I used to get in there and just dust around with my mates instead of doing any, any work. And uh, so we, we did the clay modeling thing. Like and, what, and what was the reason you just mess around in art clubs with your mites? <laughs> what? Why? What was your What was your mental attitude towards art? I just thought it was stupid. Stupid. Hated you hated it because? Um, I don't know. I guess I thought it was a bit girly. Girly. Okay. <laughs> so boys don't do it, yeah. right? Yes. Stupid. Okay. So then he comes to Sashin, and lo and behold, we're doing art. Yeah. Correct. So I, just, I thought, right, I'm going to go. I hate this. I'm leaving. I saw a car driving away, and I thought, right, yeah. And then sort of five minutes later, I thought, actually, realistically, I'm, I'm not leaving, am I? Um. So there, that was good. That was good. He asked the question, is this true? <laughs> is this absolutely true? And what would be, my life be like if it weren't true that I was leaving? And then? So then I, I just got on with it. And actually, I, I did the best bit of artwork I've ever done. I really, I really enjoyed doing it. Aha. Uh -huh. So, that's an example of liberation. Okay, very simple. But now he's free to do artwork if he wants to, for the rest of his life, to explore that whole realm which was previously shut out of the little box called Andrew. Okay, this is exactly how it works. So, Steve, where is Steve? <laughs>